Hey everybody, good morning. I want to thank you for joining us uh, live feed uh, and those that were able to be here uh, in person, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, this is not on the regular Revelation study group. I could not get the live feed to come up. So I thought the next best thing would be to just put it out in a general post. Uh, and um, so I'll also put a note on and in the live feed for this group, the Revelation Study Group, that this is where it can be located at. But again, I want to thank you for joining me now, or maybe sometime uh, down uh, the road. Um, last week, we had uh, studied some of Daniel chapter 2, and um, the purpose of me going back into Daniel is because I believe that Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 particularly tie in with Revelation chapter 13 primarily, but also I can see where there is some tie in with, with Revelation 17 and Revelation 21 as well out of uh, these two chapters of Daniel. Now, understand something too though, clarification, that Daniel chapter seven through Daniel chapter 12 is all about end time <coughs> prophetical happenings all right but two and seven particularly again tie in with revelation 13 because it's laying the foundation for uh the coming of the beast and the antichrist uh but uh before we begin let's take this to the lord in prayer heavenly father lord we thank you for this day lord we thank you for the abundance of your mercy and your grace and lord we thank you for uh giving us the opportunity to gather lord whether it's in your house here or Father, uh, with whether it's at someone's home and they're watching this uh, via the live feed. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to participate. We ask that you would just open up each of our mind and heart to receive your word. And Lord, uh, our ears to listen. Father, I just ask that you would let every wing and every word be easy to uh, say and easy to listen to. And Lord, in the end, we ask that you would help this study Lord, to uh, promote personal growth uh, within each one of us uh, spiritually, and also that we could use any part of it as an evangelization tool to reach others, uh, Lord, uh, for Christ as we talk about these matters and these happenings of the latter days. Father, Lord, we just thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're gonna just go ahead and we're gonna start in Daniel chapter 7 verse 1 we're going to start right from the outset in the first year of belshazzar king of babylon daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters now belshazzar was the, was the a and the grandson of the great king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that can, should indicate to us how long that Daniel had been in as a part of the, the kingdom of Babylon. And in, I'm gonna call it the administration of the kings. Uh, he was a uh, part of um, the, the court uh, for the king. And, um, if you remember where Daniel really burst on the scene is when Nebuchadnezzar had his prophetical dream of, remember the giant statue, uh, and no, no one could tell the king uh, what that was. They couldn't have any capability of interpreting it. Daniel and his friends matched uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, again, that's their Syriac Chaldean names. Um, they fell on their knees. They prayed for God for revelation. <laughs> And that he would give Daniel the wisdom and the knowledge and the discernment of what the dream was. And Daniel was taken before the king, and guess what? He hit that ball right out of the ballpark. He hit a home run. Uh, as we would look uh, at things today. He was able to not just in interpret it, but he was also uh, able to um, really, through God, build up his reputation of a go-to guy and man in that uh, court and in that kingdom. Um, 
Now, where you may find some familiarity with that name Belshazzar, <clears throat> because in, in, um, in a later chapter here in Daniel, this is where the infamous handwriting on the wall takes place. This was, this, this was King Belshazzar that Daniel interpreted. Remember, remember many, many tickle you farson? And Daniel was able to interpret that. Uh, and um, he was elevated to the third position uh, of the kingdom. It lasted all about eight to 10 hours because little did anybody know, but the Medes and the Persians were starting to besiege the city and they took the city that night. Uh, so if you see that name Belshazzar, something else I want you to remember is Daniel's Syriac and Chaldean names, name was Belteshazzar, right? Not to be confused with Belshazzar, even though both interconnected with one another in the storylines, those are two different people. Now, something to note too is the Daniel notes that this was in the first year of his reign. So the first year that Belshazzar took the throne, right, hereditarily, all right, from his family and his lineage, this is when these things started to go down. Now, uh, as Nebuchadnezzar had, had dreams, and I got a funny feeling that there were probably other instances and situations where Daniel was called upon uh, that we are not privy to, all right, that aren't, that aren't, weren't recorded for us to, to, uh, to know about. Um, but now, this time, it was Daniel's turn to have a dream, wasn't it? Now, between chapters 7 and 12, will you find, and, and do the study on your own sometime, or maybe we'll just do a study about it, that four times in those in those five chapters, Daniel had a vision and a significant dream that was prophetical. But this one here was the most profound, and it was the first of the Daniel's recorded prophetical dreams. Um, now, verse 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great See, now, see, he remembered his dream, and um, no one else would have been able to interpret it, would have they? <laughs> All right. So God gave him the ability to also then, in turn, be able to interpret what uh, the Lord wanted. Now, I think I had mentioned last week that uh, I'm one. You asked me what I dream dreamt about last night. I can't tell you. I I don't retain. Uh, probably because I'm up three or four nights hitting the bathroom probably that I don't sleep deeply enough to have dreams that I remember um, but I don't I, I do not remember anything that I dream and I feel blessed honestly uh, with that because how many times have we dreamt something that's been scary or frightening and, and then it kind of haunts us then uh, and that, that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar you know uh, here but, but I feel fortunate that I don't experience those uh, those uh, kind of things um, so anyways this was another night vision he dreamt he was dreaming but yet it was it was a direct dialect in a sense with God God was speaking to him and showing him things in this dream and so he called it a vision because it was a vision God was giving him uh, items and objects uh, that were going to relate to the coming of the end days. Now, he said that the four winds of heaven were stirring up the sea. Um, and what did he see? Well, we don't know until verse 3, do we? And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. Now, I believe that the sea that he's referring to was most likely the Mediterranean, right? Because that was the region that, uh, that they were in, where the Mediterranean would have been, I feel, the most likely of the seas that this vision was shown through. St 
stirring up. Now, what the four winds were, in my opinion, was symbolic um, that there was a stirring up of chaos and tumult. There, I, um, I can't go out on, on boats. I, I've gone on fishing trips before. I get sicker than a dog. It doesn't mean it matter if I take Dramamine. It doesn't matter what I take. I just get so I just get sick, really sick to the stomach. Uh, uh, so um, imagine uh, being looking at a sea and it was storming and the waves were crashing. That's that's what I'm picturing in my mind. That is how uh, Daniel uh, had, had seen this. Oh, it, 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 it could have, you know, it could have been the basis of, but I don't think Daniel was shown any of that. He would just seen, in my opinion, discernment that the sea was just tumultuous. What the basis was, I, I, I don't know, if there even was one, okay? Um, now, in Scripture, we find several different times that the term sea also is perhaps not referring to an actual sea, but it refers to people. I could be that he was seeing also a picture of the Gentile nations. The four winds could have been several different things, but I believe they represented the satanic forces bearing down upon this world. Because we, as we know in, in Revelation, it's gonna get real ugly here, folk, <laughs> uh, when God starts unleashing his judgment upon uh, this world. And I think from the, the earlier studies that we've done in, uh, in Revelation, uh, we will see that this world is going to be very tumultuous, <laughs> and it's going to be very riled up. And many, much of that is from verse chapter 12 in Revelation, whenever Satan and his companions and his imps are cast uh, to this earth, and all hell's going to break loose when this happens. So is the world going to be in tumult? Yep. And it is going to be from satanic and demonic forces is why it's going to be that way. So again, I don't know for sure, but this is my discernment. Now, something I want you to notice in verse three, the four beasts that Daniel saw, they were identified as beasts, but yet he said each one was different. They didn't look the same. Each one had a different look and identity to it. Now, let's do verse, I wanna do verse four through six and then we're gonna backtrack and we're gonna really talk a, a little bit more in depth about these verses. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it arise and devour much flesh after this I beheld and lo another like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl the beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it uh, you want to talk about a nightmarish uh, dream or it could have been I don't think it was for him um, but I was just uh, uh, talking uh, earlier in um, about uh, Stephen King if you remember and um, you know this almost seems like a Stephen King movie uh, that's starting to uh, become unleashed but but we know I'm just kind of messing around with you uh, this was a direct vision uh, from God um, so in these Four, three verses, four, five, and six, we see a description of the first three beasts. Now, the first to Daniel in his explanation was, 
that it was like a lion with wings. And as he continued to see this beast, he witnessed that its wings were plucked of its feathers. And it was made to stand upright like a man, and it received a man's heart and was given to it. Um, gotta admit, that's, that that's a strange scenario, uh, what was uh, starting to be revealed to Daniel. Now, I look at lions and eagles, that they are the majestic kings of their species. When you think of a lion, uh, and you think of the rest of the cat species, <laughs> the lion is a creme de la creme, okay? He is the king of uh, that species, uh, the cat, a feline. The eagle, if you think of all the fowls that, uh, uh, that are known, is there anything more majestic in the species of a fowl or the bird kingdom than an eagle? Not in my opinion, okay? So these two are the, and are the majestic kings of their species. This lion, though, was humbled and made human. Now, we're gonna see when we reach verse 17 that all the beasts represented the kingdoms that had ruled the world or will are or will rule upon the world. Now remember, back in this day, this ancient time, when you see the word world or over all of the earth, or maybe there's other uh, ways of saying it, we're talking about their known world at that time when all these happenings were going on, these people were living it out. Think of, um, I think, what are we gonna say, Matthew or Luke chapter one, two, one maybe, off the top of my head. And Caesar Augustus put forth a decree that all the world should be taxed. Now, did that include North America? Did that include uh, uh, the Australian continent? Well, that's right, we don't, okay? So that meant the world that revolved around the Roman Empire. Now, so whenever I say uh, things like they represented the kingdoms ruling the earth, it was in that geog uh, geographical area that we're, that we're talking about. And, and of course, you, you know that Babylon all right, is, uh, was located in modern day Iraq. But in biblical time, when the, the, when we're gonna talk about Persia here in just a little bit. In biblical time, Persia w was, an it, 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 it was Iran and Iraq as we know it today. And so from Jerusalem to Babylon would have been northeast. Babylon would have been northeast of uh, Israel, as we know the geography uh, today. Um, now, the first was the Babylonian kingdom represented by this lion with eagle's wings. I think if you've ever really taken the time to study uh, the early chapters of the book of Daniel, um, Nebuchadnezzar had a very majestic kingdom. Remember one of the seven great wonders of the world? Again, geographically speaking, remember it was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? Mm -hmm. So they had uh, a, uh, a, I feel, a very majestic society. Pagan society, yep, <laughs> but it was majestic uh, nonetheless and, and authoritative. Uh, the king's word was the, the buck stopped here and stopped there. He had a very interesting, but yet, depending on one's viewpoint, a, a, a great reign over uh, Babylon here. In Jeremiah 49, 19 through 22, if you're taking notes, Jeremiah, now get this, he pictured Nebuchadnezzar as the lion and the eagle. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay. 
okay? Jeremiah would have had, I think, a very good first-hand accounting of Nebuchadnezzar's role because he was taken into captivity with Daniel. And again, this would be the Syriac names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Jeremiah, I think, would have been very well versed and very capable of picturing Nebuchadnezzar in a certain way or shape or form. Now, at the National Museum in Britain, there are a pair of artifacts from Babylon. And you know what they are? Winged lions. And so I have no question at all that the first beast that, that I want to keep saying John, <laughs> I keep catching myself, that Daniel witnessed was the kingdom of Babylon, represented by the winged lion. Now, the second beast, he said, looked like a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, arise and devour much flesh. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a wild one to figure out too, isn't it? But I think we have it figured out. Second beast was a bear. This beast did not have the majesticness of the lion with the eagle's wings. Obviously, it was slower. Now, I want to tell you, I think if any of us were chased by a bear, we wouldn't think it was slow at all. <laughs> but I'm just saying in reactionary uh, terms here. It was slower, but yet it was stronger than the lion and more crushing. And this bear had a ferocious appetite for conquest. Thus, the saying that was said to it, arise and eat flesh. Now, Daniel also said there was something very unique to the look of this beast. That he said that it kind of rose itself up on its side. Remember, you've got to be creative. You've got to try to picture, uh, make a mental picture uh, of, of this. That it rose up on its side, and as it looked at him, it had three ribs in its mouth. That beast represented the Medio Persian Empire, which we know succeeded the lion with the eagle wings of the Babylonian kingdom. Remember, I said earlier, Belshazzar was on the throne when Medio Persian Empire came and defeated that great kingdom of Babylon. This kingdom was the second in the prophetical utterances that Daniel saw. Now, many believe, and I think it's really possible, that the three ribs that we that saw, it saw in its mouth, that that represented the three great conquests of the Medes and the Persians. Now, one thing, something I want to add to that is in that alliance of the Medes and the Persians, the Persians were absolutely the dominant of the, of the military aspect of that kingdom. So I think it would have been the Persians, maybe with the assistance and the alliance of the Medes that did, went on these conquests. But those three conquests, remember, who did they defeat first? Just talked about it, Babylon. They then went and they defeated Egypt, and then they defeated the nation of Ladaya. Now, the armies of this kingdom, of the Medes and the Persians, it was a huge, slow-moving army. But they also were crushing because they just simply overwhelmed the enemy that they were uh, up against here. What that reminds me of is the, the story in its, in, its, in its written history. The story of the, what was called the Battle of Thermopylae. 
okay, or Hell's Gate is what another term was for it. This was a battle that the Persians brought to the Greek and the Greek alliances. There was a pass in the mountains, it was called, again, they called it Hell's Gate, but we know it uh, better as its real name, uh, Thermopylae. This is the story of the of uh, uh, King. Uh, I know you know it, the Nidus. That three he and three hundred Spartans or warriors from Greece, along with about seven thousand additional troops from outlying cities in Greece, that they actually. Um, st came to a stalemate against the Persians because there was only one way to get into Athens other than by sea, and that's a different story in that, of that history, and it was through this pass, a narrow pass. So what they did is they blocked that pass. Every attempt that the Persians would make, they would repel it. But also every attempt that the Persians would make, the Greeks started dwindling in number here. They may have been able to completely rep, uh, repel that Persian attack. However, they were sold out. They were betrayed from within. And they were overwhelmed, and we know that Persia went and conquered Greece, but about 20, I think it was about 20 years later, the Greeks rose up and actually drove the Persians uh, back out of their occupancy in, in, uh, in Greece. Um, now, this kingdom was known to be very bloodthirsty and cruel like a ferocious meat-hunting bear. Any questions? Okay, and I'm lucky from the live feed. I'm not getting thrown any at me, and so briskly moving along. Just kidding out there. The third beast was as a leopard. This represented the kingdom that I was just referring to, the Greek kingdom. Who is the most famous of the Greeks other than uh, King Leonidas at the, uh, at the Pass of Thermopylae? Who is most associated in history with Greece? Bingo, all right? Alexander the Great. He represented the Greek kingdom. And did you know that by age 28, Alexander the Great had conquered just about the entire known world, geogra geographically speaking, in that time and culture, in time? I don't think that history has any rival to Alexander's quests and his conquerings. Now, we also see that this leopard had four wings. How many wings did the lion have? That's right. Okay, now there's, there's, this is symbolic. All right, this beast had four wings, indicating its swiftness and its cleverness. In 12 years, Alexander the Great has swept through all the countries of uh, Alacram, the Adriatic Sea, and the Indian Ocean to the river Ganges. And he also subdued part of Europe and just about all of Asia. But you know, after he had conquered the known world, oh, do you two need a study sheet? I saw you conversing back there. Jack, could you give these to them? Uh, we're gonna be on the page that starts out with the third beast was a leopard. I'm, yeah. It's just like Sundays, I get all these looks at me, like what the heck is this guy talking about? <laughs> I'll give you a second, Pat and Bonnie, to catch it. It's like the sec maybe the third page back, maybe. It, again, the header starts out with the third beast was a leopard. Did you find it yet? I don't want to continue until you do. It's actually going to be like the fourth page, Yeah, I said. Okay. All right, good. 
Um, <clears throat> so we are going to be about a third of the way down that page. And it doesn't help any either that my it's my handwritten scribble. Uh, uh, but it, you can read it. Too. But I can read it, I know. But there are times, though, I have to stop and think to myself, okay, dude, what did you write here? Because I can't make out what it is. When he died, and he died very, 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 very young, okay, his kingdom was quartered into four parts to his military generals. Cassander, uh, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. The P is silent in that name, okay? It's Ptolemy, is how it was pronounced. Now, it's said that these first three animals dominated its prey in different ways. We see that the, that the, uh, the, the lion was a devourer that the bear was a crusher, and that the leopard sprung swiftly upon his enemies and its prey. Now, let's read verse seven and eight because now we're gonna come to um, probably the most important of the beast in regard to prophecy. After I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now we're starting to possibly see the relation to Revelation 13, aren't we? Where it's becoming obvious. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. The fourth beast was even more dreadful than the first three. But there was something that was uh, conspicuous about it that it sounds like it should have been the least point, but it was the bigger point, is that, remember he said that it had ten heads? Significant. But where the main point is in that verse or statement is the little horn. Okay? It seems like it should be the least among us, but it's the major component to all this. This beast was much different than the first three. It was a brutal beast. And again, it had ten horns to complement the terror look that it had. Now, in the ancient world, horns expressed the power and fearsomeness of a beast. Because of what ten horns meant was that this beast was of maximum power. Now, now, in historical fulfillment, the fourth beast was representative of the Roman Empire. I want to take a step back into chapter 2. <clears throat> Let me see here. see where I want to start this at. Thirty-six, chapter two, verse thirty-six, if you have your Bibles. This is the dream. Now remember, this is uh, Daniel interpreting that terrifying dream that, remember, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember. That God had revealed it to, to, to Daniel. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of, of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And whosoever the children of men dwell, wheresoever the children of men dwell, 
The beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given unto you thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art his head of gold. And remember, he's given the description of this, this statue uh, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, had dreamt of. So he said, the head is you, because you are the king over the greatest kingdom until this time in the world, in, in, yeah, in, in history of time. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all of the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these things shall it break in pieces and bruise. The first kingdom, the first part, the head of gold, all right, represented Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. In 39, Daniel says, and after thee shall rise another kingdom. So what would, what would Babylon have been represented in David, or Daniel's dream of chapter 7, remember? What was the first beast? Remember it was a lion with two wings? That the wings were plucked off, which meant that it was going to be a kingdom that had was going to be coming to an end, okay, uh, here. That was Babylon. And after, 39, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. That would have been the second beast of chapter 7. What was that beast? Do you remember? A bear, all right? That represented the Medio Persian Empire that we know. I've explained it to you a couple of times. It conquered the Babylonians under the rule of Belshazzar. Okay, the third kingdom would be it was that was a brass. Now, which shall bear rule over all of the earth? Now, do you see by that statement, Daniel or God was revealing that your kingdom, even though it's great, Nebuchadnezzar, is still going to have its limitations, all right? The media of Persians are going to follow you, but they're not going to be as strong as what you are. But there's a third kingdom that's going to follow them, that they are going to rule over all the earth. Now, remember, that was the known world, okay, that we are speaking to. And what was that third kingdom? What was it in Daniel's dream in seven, chapter seven? It was the leopard or the kingdom of Greece through Alexander the Great. And the fourth kingdom, verse 40, shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. That kingdom was, was represented by this fourth beast that Rome became the, the greatest empire that had been in the history of time, greater than the Babylonians, greater than the Medes and the Persians, greater than the Greeks. And its expanse was just unbelievable, uh, how much ground, it, it, it covered more ground geographically than even the Greeks had, all right? So most scholars that I follow anyways, apply this fourth beast initially and originally as the Roman Empire. So remember, we had the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. Now, another correlation is the ten horns to the ten toes of the image in chapter 2. Let me see here. Um, where do I want to jump into this? Okay. 20. And of the 10 horns that were in his head, remember we keep coming up with these 10 horns, don't we? And of the other which came up, and before him three fell. Okay, this is, this is uh, uh, Daniel uh, uh, in interpretation of, of his dreams. So the little horn arose and this little horn w would become greater than the ten combined 
the little horn then costs three of the ten original horns on the beast to be plucked out by its roots. He said it had eyes like a man, but it was arrogant and it was boastful in its speech. So, what does all this mean? Heck, I don't know. We're going to close up shop for the day. No, I'll give you my best explanation, okay, and what my best discernment is. I believe that the first three beasts, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, that it was showing that even as powerful as the Babylonians were, and then the Medes and the Persians, and then the great Greek empire under Alexander the Great, that these kingdoms paled in comparison to the Roman kingdom because it was so much more powerful. The fourth beast showed the ten horns. Now, there are many scholars that point to those ten horns in latter day times as being from the European Union and its original members. And as the end time horns and the little horn as the Antichrist and his kingdom. Or some re refer to this as the revised Roman Empire. Now, I'm going to be honest. I can't say that I'm totally sold on the theology that the end time ten horns are ten of the original members of the EU. I'm not sold on that, okay? But I am sold on the fact that the little horn is definitely the Antichrist, okay, the beast, okay? I think that those ten horns could very feasibly be and become like 10 different provinces around the globe that the Antichrist kingdom, world kingdom, may be broken up into 10 different sections or areas. Some, we, we may think of it as the seven uh, world con continents, right? But this would obviously be a little broader than that. Again, folk, I'm giving you my best discernment <laughs> and my best thoughts, but it should make our wheels spin. I know you're impatient, Chilcott. I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because you're not really an impatient man, I don't think. I don't think you're an impatient man. You put up with me for how many years? I know it has. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing we get along so well, huh, John? All right, but I think that maybe that could be a possibility. Uh, but Daniel said that the little horn conquered, in a sense, these ten other horns. But he took three of those ten, and Daniel said as he saw it, it plucked the three horns and pulled them out by the roots. Okay? So there are evidently, whatever these ten horns end up being, that the Antichrist, whether they turn against him, whether they are obedient to him, whether they may rise up in insurrection against him, I don't know, but he is going to absolutely utterly destroy three of these ten horns, okay? And I personally think it's because they were not in sync with his role. Okay, um, so again, could it be the original 10 members of the European Union or 10 drawn out? Because how many is there? Isn't there like 27 or 36 members now of the EU, something of that nature? I can't remember exactly. Um, but it could, it's possible that it could be the 10 strongest out of that uh, confederation uh, union. Uh, could, is it, could it be that it is going to be 10 different uh, segments of the world that in three of them aren't uh, listening to or obeying the commands. Uh, I don't know. But I know this. 
that this is, indicates to me that in Revelation, when it says that the Antichrist, the beast, will conquer all the world, and the world will all come into subjection to him, that we know for absolute sure. How that's exactly going to happen, we could be here for quite some time putting out possibilities, couldn't we? And throwing them around. We don't know 100% sure what those 10 other horns are indicating, but what I get out of this is whatever they end up being, they're going to all come into subjection to the rule of the Antichrist, and if they don't, he'll destroy them. Now, we still have a few minutes. Now, Jerry, let's turn to Revelation. Revelation 13. It's the last book in the Bible. I'm just throwing that out. I'm just making sure you, you knew that. Chapter 13. Now, we've already studied chapter 13. But I want to hit the very beginning of it. Because soon as we get through the first couple of verses, I'm telling you, folk, you're going to have an epiphany and a light bulb is going to come on and say, okay, now I see why PJ went back to Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Because... Listen to what John said. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and how many horns? Ten. ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, which to me meant kings, okay, or kingdoms. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Well, I'd say right out of the gate, we get the understanding that this is a, this is a demonic, satanic uh, uh, beast that he sees. All right, blasphemy. What does blasphemy in its purest sense mean? Anybody remember? Godly? Mm -hmm. Elevating. Put those two together, guys. Elevating oneself to equality with God. What's one of the things the Antichrist is going to do? He's not only going to lift himself in equality with God, he's going to say, I am God. That is the epitome of blasphemy, <laughs> to just push, put God totally out of the picture and say, oh, no, 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 I'm God here. So look at two. You're going to start to see some familiar words. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth as a mouth of a lion. Does that sound anywhere to familiarity uh, to what we read in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7? Now, I think what the meaning to that is, is that the Babylonians were strong. The Mede and Persians, a little less strong. But then the Greeks conquering the entire known world. Remember? The lion, the bear, and the leopard. And I think what God was revealing to John was is that the strength of those combined kingdoms was going to be found within this beast in the Antichrist. That all of the power and all of the strength and all of the influence that those kingdoms had in the world, they're all going to be wrapped up and it's going to be a, a characteristic of the Antichrist. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Okay, now we're throwing another beast into the mix. The dragon. I don't remember Daniel talking about a dragon, do you? No, he didn't. But roundaboutly, he did. Who is the dragon of Revelation? Satan. The devil himself. That it's going to be Satan that gives him his power. He's going to offer him his seat. And again, I I'm taking that as his power and, and abilities. And he's going to give him great authority. In fact, let's be honest about this. He's going to give him absolute authority in this world during the tribulation. Particularly the second half, three and a half years. Because that is the defining moment in those first, in that, is this three and a half years 
of the second part for the seven, that's when the Antichrist will go into the newly built temple in Jerusalem. And this is where his blasphemous mouth says, I am God and you will worship me. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue the forty and two months. So, and we've talked about this, and I'll finish up the session with this. At some point in time, probably close to the three and a half year midpoint of the seven year tribulation, the Antichrist, I feel, is going to have an assassination attempt brought upon him. Now, two things, and I think there's two possibilities. One is, is that he does die, but the false prophet with satanic ability raises him back to life again. Now, you can see where that's a mockery of the Savior, our Savior, in the resurrection. The other possibility is it's all a rue, that it's all a setup, so that, that, he, that he wasn't uh, assassinated, he wasn't dead, he never died, but they made it and they staged it to look like he did. And what would be the reasoning for that to happen? Mimic the resurrection of Christ, yep. the crucifixion and the resurrection. M m m mimic the resurrection and the crucifixion. That's right, death and then life. But the other reason, if it is, it does end up being a root, is to bring the world into compliance and looking and saying, this man has to be the Messiah because he was killed and he was resurrected again. And what does the world do? They ultimately will accept him as a Messiah. Can you see, even through the first six or seven verses of chapter 13, that Daniel's prophecies of two and seven were pretty spot on compared, and in comparing it to what John was re revealed to John, and especially in the opening chat of verses of chapter 13, to me, we can look at that in amazement, but then I think we can look at it again and saying, that was God being God, preparing this world for what's to come. And a part of this revelation in Daniel study is my hope is that you and I and anybody that catches these live feeds, that they'll understand and that will understand these things are coming. And they may be coming faster than what we would ever want to believe. That means that we need to be right with God. That if we don't have Christ as our Savior, that we need to get our acting gear. And for we believers, if we truly believe these things are coming, then we need to shout it from the housetops and proclaim it from the mountaintops. That God's word will be revealed and that Jesus saves, and he can save anyone and everyone from the judgment of what's to come. Thank you for being here today, everybody. All of those that will, are or will be watching live feed, thank you. And uh, next week, we're going to jump in, and we're going to start Revelation 14. Uh, so if you want to do some pre-reading or uh, studying uh, on that, uh, it might be good. That way you, you know going in what's, what's going on. Um, but uh, God's good though isn't he God is good all the time Pat can you release us today <clears throat> our Heavenly Father we thank you for the study that we're having yes we do and we do thank you for uh, DJ, uh, for your glory Father we ask that you Amen. We also ask for the Heavenly Father that you would just guide uh, God directly for the rest of our day. And we ask that you always listen to your prayer. Uh, yes. Yeah.
Yes, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, everybody. And Pat, I'll add to that, in Christ alone. Remember? All right. Thank you, everybody. God bless.